to heal, we must remember. It's hard sometimes to remember. But that's how we heal. It's important to do that as a nation. That's why we're here today. Between sundown and dusk, let us shine the lights in the darkness along the sacred pool of reflection. Remember all whom we lost. Four hundred lights surrounding the Lincoln Memorial's reflecting pool to honor the four hundred thousand Americans who've died since the coronavirus pandemic began in the U.S. one year ago. And that is how President Joe Biden wanted to begin his inauguration eve by showing respect and remembering the lives we've lost. I'm Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Hey guys, a little twist on the start. I like to change things up from time to time. Keep you on your toes. Keep it fresh. Keep you listening. Keep you wanting to know what we are going to cover every day on Stand Up. And joining me today is New York Times opinion columnist Elizabeth Brunig, who I used to talk all the time to uh, back in, in the day on Sirius XM. But it's been years, and I was so excited to catch up with her and talk about what I think has been one of the most undercovered issues in the last couple of months since certainly the election, which is several executions of men on death row as a result of Bill Barr and Donald Trump being the men that they are and resuming executions to federal inmates inmates on uh, death row that's something they began last year after 17 years without the federal government executing a prisoner they were more than excited to pick it back up and this conservative supreme court looked the other way and didn't gain clemency for any of them as far as i know liz brunig and i have an awesome conversation on today's show in my opinion and after that also joining me today is pam keith and Mari Sally, introducing Mari Sally. He is the co founder of the nonprofit organization United Progressive Platform. He's also producing some of Pam's new content that she's creating. And I appear with Pam on Sunday nights, and Mari is her producer. And the three of us had a conversation that they allowed me to tape, and it was serious and it was funny. And I'll share that as well on today's program. Of course, after the last 24 in the news dump, which is coming up, uh, just want to remind you, tonight at 8 p.m., we will be gathering for a stand-up community happy hour. Joining us tonight, professor and historian, expert on authoritarianism and fascism, Dr. Ruth ben Giat will join us after what I hope will be a peaceful day. I hope to see you at 8 p.m. tonight if you are a stand-up subscriber. If you are not, Sign up right now. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or just go to the paid subscription link right there at the beginning of today and every day's show notes and at the end as well. Click on that and sign up and join over 800 curious, kind, passionate, hilarious, amazing people. There's been so much adversity over the past year and a half because of COVID and four years because the president of the United States is a lunatic bent on destroying and dividing us beyond repair. But today is a new day, the inauguration of a new president and the first female vice president in America's history. And I'm feeling good, everybody. Looks like my parents are going to get their vaccines on the 4th of February, maybe sooner. They have to, I mentioned, I think I mentioned this on yesterday's show, they have to drive like three hours to get their vaccinations. And I told my dad today, I said, just go to your local place, wherever they're vaccinating and, and tell them, that you had an appointment and that they can't find it and just see if they'll give you a vaccination. And a lot of people uh, responded to me saying that on Twitter. Some of you are like, well, no, don't do that. That's dangerous. Don't send them in. They, they could get COVID. Like, well, they're they're sitting in their cars, folks. Uh, it's a it's a drive through vaccination is my understanding. But also, if you're outside with a mask on and, enough, and everybody else has a mask on, I'm I'm really not worried about you getting any of their germs or viruses. And so for that reason, those reasons, I am in a great mood. It's such a significant moment in our history to say 
goodbye to this madman and welcome the new president. And not only are we saying goodbye, not only did we vote him out and send him packing, we also deplatform him. We got his, he's gone off of social media. We can't even hear him scream anymore. And I just I want to talk about that every day. It's hard to measure the significance of that. A lot of people are pointing to one statistic of uh, how much disinformation is down. I'm not sure how such things are measured, but it would certainly seem to make a lot of sense. You think about it being just concerned all of the time because at any moment he could tweet something that wouldn't necessarily start a nuclear war or, or, or destroy us, but it would be so negative and so horrible that it would affect you if you heard about it. I mean, most sane people probably weren't following him unless they were journalists and even then. And we're trying to ignore his day to day, moment to moment temper tantrums, but it was hard to look away from. And they were so shocking so often that you had to uh, continue to be concerned about it. And now you don't. It's it's like the flowers are blooming. It's like springtime in, in, in a weird kind of way that you don't have to worry about him tweeting, because even if he wasn't president, he would still have access to social media platforms that he could stir up any kind of trouble with his repeated horrible lies and messaging at any point. And now he can't. And that's a very good thing. And it's it's hard to talk about or prove a negative. But every day I just want to mention how important I think it is that he is not able to incite violence and spread conspiracies and lies hour to hour, day to day, week after week. All right, let's get to the last 24. This is at the top of every episode of Stand Up, which come out every day. Tell your friends this is the best daily podcast you can find because I've got news and I've got great conversations and analysis with the best experts in the country and elsewhere. And so I like to at the top here share with you a bunch of audio clips, comments, tweets, thoughts, jokes, whatever that basically pertain to the last 24 hours. And I'd like to start with a clip from my friend, Professor Eddie Gloud, Dr. Eddie Gloud from Princeton University, where he teaches history, religion, politics. He's also an author whose books are amazing as well. And yesterday he was on MSNBC, which is where I met him, and they were covering the Biden inaugural committee uh, COVID-19 memorial. And Eddie Gloud took a moment to talk about the way that he can so well Uh, His friend, who he had just lost from COVID-19 and what it all meant to him. And it's just so great. Thanks to a longtime listener and friend Joe Liotta for sending this to me on Twitter. Otherwise, I might have missed it. Here it is. You know, I'm thinking as I listened and watched, I'm thinking about my good friend Charles Upshur. He died yesterday Mm -hmm. of covid died yesterday and you know the selfishness that has kind of suffocated the land was held at arm's length for a moment we've needed a national ritual to mourn so that we can think about the mourning and in for a moment just 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 listening to the words and the song and seeing the lights President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President Harris pulled the grief and regret out of the privacy of our hearts, if just for a moment, so that we all could share it. Cardinal Gregory put it powerfully, sorrow unites us, you know? We needed this ritual because the dead weren't settled. People didn't die right, Nicole. And coming out of my tradition, when folk don't die right, they haunt. So, you know, I'm thinking of Charlie when he would slice that golf ball and cuss at the top of his lungs or we would sit down and smoke cigars and talk about how bad we played and how how good we would play the next round. And thinking about all of those folks who just for the moment, the nation shared their grief. Oh, what a first step. What a beautiful step. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm reminded of the psalmist, you know. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Um, Maybe the death will speak to us now. Maybe they can rest now. Oh, what a wonderful way he has with his words. Donald Trump brought us so much pain. He took so much from us, as has COVID. But there were lights. 
You know, you didn't you didn't have to look hard for them. If you listened, if you read, if you remain curious and open, I think the lights find you. They often do in the dark. And I've discovered so many bright lights over the past four years during the Trump reign and over the past year, even since starting the podcast. And one of my favorites is a guy who I've met uh, several times when we were on panels together, I think, at MSNBC. And he's been a guest on the show several times as well. I, I love talking to him. I love reading his work. And I certainly love watching and hearing anything he has to say. So great. Eddie Gloud. And another bright light I found was uh, is Ellie Mistal, who is one of the most passionate righteous and hilarious people that I've known and gotten to know over the past couple of years as well. He was on C-SPAN again, and anytime he's on C-SPAN, he's great because he takes the crazy callers and and so on. But uh, the subject was the Trump legacy and the incoming Biden administration. And you just have to hear this two minutes or so. Here is the the host uh, reading a tweet and Ellie responding to it. So good and even better uh, to, to see it, to watch it. A couple of comments for you on Twitter. Um, this one saying not all of the founders were pro-slavery. Adams and Hamilton come to mind. but They wanted to keep the 13 states together. And the South was pro-slavery, so they compromised. Not a good compromise, but it was what they could get. Your thoughts? Couldn't have made me compromise. (laughs) Couldn't have made me compromise, right? Like, (laughs) I'm so anti-slavery that I wouldn't compromise with slavers. So, yeah, sure. Adams, Hamilton, some anti-slavery Northerners really thought slavery was a bad idea. They thought it was such a bad idea, they wouldn't put the word slavery in their constitution because it was icky. You know what was more icky? (laughs) Keeping people as slaves. That was what was more icky. That was the fight they should have had. They should have had the Civil War in 1787 if they were so anti-slavery. Love it. Love it, Ali Mistal. All right, uh, Chuck Todd stepped in shit again when he said on his show... Tuesday that if Joe Biden doesn't get the vaccine rollout right, will he have failed on the job? A day before President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration, Chuck Todd said the next president's first big test will be amping up vaccine distribution. And that's and that if it's not improved, he will have failed. But let's be realistic. Biden's first and most crucial task is to vaccinate America, to to fulfill, fulfill that promise of 100 million vaccinations in his first 100 days. The ultimate success or failure of his presidency may hinge simply on that one promise that he made. And it might be his only way to begin immediately cauterizing America's social, economic, and political wounds and begin to combat that pessimism that you saw dripping from our poll. Let's put it this way. If Biden wants to succeed, he has to fulfill that first vaccination promise because everything he wants to do revolves around convincing the public that after four years of Trump, a Biden administration can make government competent again. He doesn't even have to make it efficient, just workable. If Biden doesn't get it right, he will have failed on the job he was elected to do. Well, the reaction on Twitter was swift, uh, where he gets a lot of criticism. I was talking about Chuck Todd uh, this past Sunday and how disappointed I thought his commentary was acting like he didn't see white supremacy all this time. But after those comments... Chuck Todd was again trending on Twitter. Oliver Willis writes, Chuck Todd, before Biden is even sworn in, talking about his push for vaccines, quote, if Biden doesn't get it right, he'll have failed in the job he was elected to do. I repeat, Biden isn't even sworn in yet. Don Winslow writes, for years I've been on this platform telling you about the lack of professionalism and lack of journalistic ethics in Chuck Todd's daily broadcast. A lot of you saw it today, but it's been happening for years and it's past time at MSNBC do something about it. And the Palmer Report. Chuck Todd is already talking about the prospect of Biden's presidency being a failure. You'd think the past four years would have given Chuck Todd some perspective on what actual failure is. But no, his both sideism is so harmful to the public discourse. Get him off the air. And finally, uh, the Ricky Davila writes, holy shit balls. President Joe Biden hasn't even been sworn in yet. And you have Chuck Todd and MSNBC talking about the Biden administration being a failure for wanting to do too much good. Someone fires ass. He's so horrible every day without fail and purposely lies on top of it. I don't know if I agree with all that criticism, but I just thought it was hilarious that Chuck Todd was trending for uh, saying the day before Joe Biden even becomes president that he, he might fail. I mean, he could have phrased the question better, but <laughs> the uh, the reaction seems a little bit 
a little bit too much for me. But the both sideism is so alive and well in that one. All right, let's go from Chuck Todd's commentary to a report from Jim Acosta, who's been the White House correspondent for CNN. And I like Jim. Uh, I know him a little bit, and I know a lot of people know him. Seems like a pretty good guy, working hard uh, under the threat from the president uh, day in and day out. And he's sparred with the president of the United States several times. And I think uh, has done a, a pretty good job, even wrote a book about it. I should talk to him about that. Anyway, he was reporting on CNN last night about all the speculation surrounding who might get a pardon and talks of uh, Joe Exotic potentially getting a pardon. Yeah, there's even a limousine, uh, a big, long, ridiculously long stretch limousine waiting outside the prison that Joe Exotic is serving time I don't know what his sentence is. I don't even remember the the name of his stupid show. I watched a couple episodes of it. Uh, but it would be horrible if, if he got a pardon, like so many of the other pardons that uh, that Donald Trump has issued. And the fact, by the way, that they're, the, the president of the United States even has this power is preposterous. The idea that one man can free uh, any number of people is, 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 is absurd in a modern society or democracy. Joe Biden should, should make some announcements. They go, oh, we're reeling that power back. Uh, on my watch. Anyway, here is Jim Acosta talking about the speculation that Joe Exotic might get a pardon. And well, here it is. Word that potentially Joe Exotic, a.k.a. Tiger King, uh, could get a presidential pardon annoyed this one Trump loyalist. And in the words of this Trump loyalist, he said, and I'll just put this in a quote here because these aren't my words. This is the words from a Trump ally. I'll be pissed if that dipshit. Uh, does make the president's <laughs> list of pardons, and my client doesn't. That's so great. But so many of the pardons that Trump issued were uh, horrifically undeserved, and I want to just mention one that you might not have heard about, but I saw this headline, Trump supporter shocked after president commutes sentence of man who swindled him out of his life savings. So last week, President Trump commuted the, and I'm so glad I don't have to say President Trump anymore, fucking Donald Trump, Uh, commuted the prison sentence of a man named Fred Davis Clark, who in 2015 was convicted for crimes related to a $300 million scheme. The Tampa Bay Times reports that one of the man's victims is is a Trump supporter who is not happy with the president's decision. This guy lost his entire savings to the, the Ponzi scheme, which the United States Department of Justice said involves sales at K clubs, resorts, and marinas to approximately 1,400 investors in Florida Keys and elsewhere. The Trump supporter who got swindled said, I thought he, he'd probably die in prison and he deserved it. I was thinking that's justice because now we can just sit there the rest of his life contemplating what he's done to other people. And the man also said the president's decision to commute the fraudster sentence had shaken his faith in whether Trump had been truthful to his supporters. How about that? <laughs> That's what uh, it took you to, to have your faith shaken. Well, deal with it. That's what you get. By the way, President Trump did deliver a final address as president from the White House on Tuesday, and it was ridiculed uh, uh, as the way it should be. Only Newsback, Newsmax aired it. And now there's a movement, by the way, to get uh, Newsmax, Fox News and OAN taken off of a cable platforms. Talk about cancel culture. I love it. Anyway, President Trump made a final address in the White House. He bragged and talked about his accomplishments, celebrated himself and the achievements he was able to uh, get done in office. According to him, I don't really see it. Uh, he then wished the incoming administration well. He said, I hope they have good luck. Luck's an important thing. He actually said that. And um, but he didn't say the names Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. He refused to, of course, accept his loss. And um, he is uh, I mean, not in the speech. He didn't say anything. I don't think about the election. I watched the first 10 minutes and then I almost shot myself in the head. But unfortunately for Trump, his video was released at the same time. The president let Joe Biden arrived in Washington. So no one really gave a shot. By the way, one thing I'll be looking for tomorrow at 12 noon is a whole bunch of people speaking out when they finally can. I mean, government bureaucrats, rank and file people, uh, as well as uh, higher ranking people saying things, sharing things that they uh, couldn't share for any several number of fears or concerns about how the president and his people might react. And you can say that they should have spoken out and and we can argue about that, but it doesn't matter. It's a moot subject now. I'm just looking to see at 1201 tomorrow when Donald Trump and his evildoers in charge, his circle of villains, his legion of doom are gone and officially out of power. Who's going to come out? Who are we going to hear from tomorrow? That will be of great interest to me.
All right, I got a couple more things for you here on the last 24, and they are, first, Mitch McConnell, a quick clip from him, uh, the soon-to-be Senate minority leader. You know, he waited 38 days to acknowledge Joe Biden's win. This asshole pretended there was some kind of issue ahead of the official elective, electoral college vote on December 14th, and, you know, like that he was waiting for. And anyway, here he is on the Senate floor yesterday. The mob was fed lies. They were provoked by the president and other powerful people. And they tried to use fear and violence to stop a specific proceeding of the first branch of the federal government, which they did not like. But we pressed on. We stood together and said an angry mob would not get veto power over the rule of law in our nation. Well, it's good that he said that, but it's way too little, way too late. He carried on the big lie for long enough, as did so many others in Congress and in media, and they still are. Maria Bartiromo apparently is being considered for the 7 p.m. slot on Fox News, even though no one, I think, in corporate media, Fox News at least, carried out that lie worse than she did on a regular basis. A toady for Donald Trump. I like this guy, Stuart Reynolds. He goes by Brittle Star on social media. He's like a comedian, funny guy. He calls himself the Internet's favorite dad. And this clip was going around yesterday. I thought it was pretty good. He's Canadian, by the way. I think that matters. Which can make picking a side on any issue these days a little tricky. But don't worry. Here's how to tell if you're on the right side of any issue. If your opinion is shared by, say, scientists doctors, people who have dedicated their lives to public service, and people smarter than you, and generally good people all around the world, you're probably on the correct side of the issue. If, for example, your opinion is shared by racists, Nazis, people who change their views based on their own personal gain, regardless of the impact on others, people who've never paused to ask themselves, wait, does that make sense? The spectacularly dim, despots, cult leaders, or generally bad people, it doesn't mean you're also one of those people, but it's not looking good. And it may be time for a rethink. Take a look at who shares your views. A really close look. Actually, even a passing glance. Because as the old saying goes, you are the company you keep. I hope that helps. I like that. I thought that was great. That's a brittle star on uh, social media and YouTube and more. Smart guy who follows me on Twitter, Mike DiPolo, captured the president's accomplishments this way. He lost the popular vote twice, lost the House of Representatives, lost the Senate, put the Republican Party in shambles, greatly damaged alliances with our allies, destroyed our standing in the world, failed to overturn a democratically elected uh, election, lost 61 of 62 lawsuits in his attempt to do so, incited a mob of deadly right-wing terrorists to insurrection, presided over a pandemic that has killed over 400,000 Americans, never had an approval rating over 50 percent, was impeached twice, or as Donald Trump calls it, the greatest first term in presidential history. All right, that is the last 24. Now it's time for a news dump. But I just want to say before I do it, thank you so much for listening and supporting the podcast. I'm very excited for what is to come with it and covering, obviously, all things that come out of our federal government with the Biden administration. But getting back to some of the other more specific issues and talking to the people who know so much about them, some of the typical social, local, environmental problems that we all deal with, relationship stuff, anxiety and depression, financial stuff, all the things that I've always talked about with experts for years that we can spend more time on because we don't have to worry moment to moment, day to day, tweet to tweet about what the president is doing in our name. It was four years ago tonight. It was the night before inauguration. I don't know exactly four years ago tonight that I was in Washington, D.C. I was there for SiriusXM to cover the inauguration and then the Women's uh, March protest, which was the the day after. And the night before the inauguration, there obviously was this horrible gray cloud over the world and what we were about to witness the next day. And we weren't wrong. His speech was absolutely horrific. But that night, that night before, I, I had a few drinks at my hotel in Washington, D.C. It's actually Mark Preston's hotel room that I was staying in. You couldn't get a a room anywhere. And so I shared a room with him because CNN had given him one uh, right near the CNN bureau. And so 
I decided to have a few beers and then for some reason go for a run. I know that sounds weird. It's not something I, I don't think I've ever done before or since, but I, I just, I had a little buzz on and I was just so anxious and exercise and, and running for me is always something that helps. Plus it's DC and I love running in DC. So I went out about eight o'clock at night and I ran over to the White House. And when I got there, I just screamed to the top of my lungs. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Michelle and Barack. And then this kind Capitol police officer who was pacing back and forth took pity on me and simply said to me, hey, buddy, this is the Treasury Department. The White House is a couple blocks away. Thanks, officer. Anyway, (laughs) I thought that was funny and I wanted to share it with you. All right, it's time for the news dump. As many news stories as I can fit into about three minutes. Not political, not COVID, but totally undercovered. And some of them don't matter at all, but they're just funny and entertaining. So here we go. Time for the news dump. All right, let's start with a story from Detroit. This is a story about air travel and conflict and being an asshole. Two agents were injured and two passengers were destroy- were arrested after a clash at Detroit Metro Airport. Uh, The agents blocked the passengers from boarding a Sunday flight to Atlanta without authorization, according to Spirit Airlines. They say it was not a fight. Describing it as a fight is untrue to our agents. In actuality, three passengers attacked our agents without provocation. Began when employees asked the passengers to show that their carry-on bags did not exceed size requirements, according to ABC. And the agents tried to calmly defuse the situation, Spears said. But then when they closed the door to keep the passengers from boarding, they were physically assaulted. So uh, you can watch a video of this uh, where an agent's being punched and knocked down. And uh, I mean, I I think it really is their fault for flying Spirit in the first place. Uh, But that is annoying when you're when your bag, they tell you your bag's not going to fit when you know it's going to. But it's not that annoying. (laughs) I mean, you can't yell at a person and then try to fight them. All right. Let's move on to stock market, where I'll quickly mention stocks closed higher on Wall Street Tuesday, recovering from some of last week's losses, pulling closer to their record highs. Markets have been rising on enthusiasm about a coming economic recovery as COVID-19 vaccines roll out. And amid expectations that Washington will soon try to deliver another round of economic stimulus, Also, markets like the certainty of Joe Biden not being a crazy maniac tweeting anything he wants from the shitter every two minutes. So markets care about that, too. Crazy and terrifying story coming out of China where 11 miners are trapped underground after an explosion at a Chinese mine. They're getting nutritional liquids and medicine delivered through a long, thin communication tunnel. But apparently they're requesting uh, to have some pork sausages as well so wow i mean you're trapped down there and uh, you're demanding pork sausages 22 men were trapped at the mine on january 10th an explosion damaged the exit and the communication system of the mine which is still under construction the cause of the explosion is not known put them in your thoughts and prayers if that's the thing that you do A 16th century copy of Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, the world's most expensive painting, has been recovered by Italian police after it was stolen from a museum in Naples. The artwork, which is likely painted by one of da Vinci's master students, was discovered at an apartment during a search in the Italian city, according to a police statement. The property's 36-year-old owner was found nearby and taken into custody on suspicion of receiving stolen goods. Wow. Well, that's good news. The monarch butterfly population moves closer to extinction, reporting from the Associated Press. The number of western monarch butterflies wintering along the California coast has plummeted precipitously to a record low, putting the orange and black insects closer to extinction, researchers announced Tuesday. Scientists say the butterflies are at critically low levels in western states because of destruction to their milkweed habitat along their migratory route as housing expands into their territory and use of pesticides and herbicides increases. So it's us, monarchs. I guess we're better than them, huh? Netflix has topped 200 million subscribers for the first time. The streaming giant said it added a record 37 million subscribers in 2020. I wonder what it was in 2020 that made so many people subscribe to Netflix, because it's certainly not their original programming. 
garbage, I said. All right, maybe not all of it. Maybe that was a little too harsh. They've done some good, uh, some great stand-up comic stuff. I like The Crown, and I'm, I'm sure there's some good original movies, though I can't think of any off the top of my head. Some good documentaries, too, right? All right, a little harsh, but uh, congratulations, Netflix. I've got eight hundred, over 800 paying subscribers, so eat shit. Please subscribe. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Okay, that is your news dub for today. All right, coming up, a conversation with Mari Sally and my friend Pam Keith. But first, I've got New York Times opinion columnist Elizabeth Brunig, or Liz, as her friends call her. Liz joined me often back on the old show when she was at the New Republic, and then she went to the Washington Post, and now she is at the New York Times. She's a great writer who was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize uh, last year. She's a self-identified Catholic leftist. She writes about religion, ethics, politics, poverty, culture, and lately she's been writing a lot about capital punishment, the death penalty, and executions in our country, one of which she actually witnessed herself and wrote about that experience back in December at the New York Times. And Liz and I sat down yesterday for a chat about the increase of executions under the Trump administration and his Department of Justice, specifically starting in July. Liz has been so good on this issue and so many others for so long, and it's been a while since we had spoken. So I was so happy to catch up with her. Looking forward to do interviewing her husband, Matt Brunig. Check out his awesome organization, People Policy Project, peoplespolicyproject.org, and check out the podcast that Liz and her husband Matt do together. I was listening to it to prepare for this interview, and I, I really enjoyed it. It's called The Brunigs, and I'll link to all that in the show notes, as I always do for every episode. Here now, my conversation with Liz Brunig. I really think you're going to like it. All right, well, it has been way, way too long since I talked to Elizabeth Brunig, and it has been like two kids in a marriage ago for you, and I'm so excited uh, to have you on the podcast. Congratulations, on first of all, on your family. How's it going? Wow. Little kids in quarantine. I know, I know. And, and a four and a half year old and an 18 month old. Um, but, you know, you think about having a couple of kids home with you in quarantine, but it's not just having a couple of kids. It's having your kids and they're individual people. And, uh, and they are people that I'm used to. And like, is it insane around here most of the time? Yeah. There's always something kind of sticky on the floor and I don't know what it is. And, um, my older daughter rubbed her entire body down with a stamp ink pad. <laughs> um, turned herself completely red. Who has one of those? First of all, that's your fault. Who, what are you using that for? What are you stamping? I, <laughs> I was like, I can get her some stamps. I love stamps when I was right. little. She'll, she'll be responsible. <laughs> So I, I really, you know, I played myself. Um, That's real funny. <laughs> the little one, you know, is, is getting increasingly crafty. Um, She's a year and a half. What, yeah. She, so one of her first words was shit. Oh. <laughs> which I'm, I'm sure she hears me say constantly like, oh, shit. Right. Because she's, you know, climbing up the stairs or the bookcases or something. Plus the last um, year of, of everybody's life, it was probably used even more than, than you normally would. Absolutely. I feel like uh, we should all get a pass on our kids using profanity at school. You know, we all had to get by somehow. We should all get a pass for so much right now. I always the, the one thing that's helped me kind of stay centered is lowering the bar on everything, every experience, yes. uh, you name it. And just being happy with what's I mean, my but my main question to you, anybody with with young kids during this period of time while quarantine Trump's last year, pre do you, do you still love them? Oh yeah. You do. Okay. They have haven't gotten more to the point every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, you haven't decided to give I, them away. Well, they become a, uh, well, our older daughter was terrified for a while that we were going to take Claire back to the hospital, um, <laughs> which she felt like we bought her from or something. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I eventually said, you know, Claire doesn't, she didn't come from the hospital. She grew in my tummy. That's why my tummy was big before and then little afterward. And that, again, I played myself because she's like, how did Claire get into your tummy? And I was like, I don't know. I was fucking choked completely. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's. I didn't want to have that conversation. Um, Daddy planted a seed. He has a bag of seeds. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what lies you have to tell to help a child. Exhaustible bag of seeds. Yeah, that's another quarantine <laughs> thing. Who's getting any work done if they're shacked up with their spouse? Um, but yeah, so we we had to avoid. Uh, that conversation, but I, I feel like it's coming one day. It's great to be talking to you again. I've really been enjoying catching up on all of your latest columns in, in preparation to speak with you, and I've also uh, thoroughly enjoyed watching your success over the past couple of years. I mean, you went from the New Republic to the Washington Post to the New York Times. It seems like you're, you're really doing a lot of what you want to be doing, but in case people aren't familiar with your work, how would you describe you know, kind of your beat and what you write about? Because it, it covers such a wide Wide range of politics, religion, philosophy. Where's your head at now and what you're writing with the New York Times? How would you describe it for people who maybe aren't familiar with you? Well, first of all, a great deal of my success has to do with you. I'm sorry? You know, you were one of the very first people who took an interest in what I was doing. And I remember being at the New Republic and my colleagues, because the New Republic at that time had recently fallen apart, as usual. Mm. And so like half the people there, maybe a third, were well-known writers who had been writing for years and years and had won awards and were really part of the sort of old New Republic. And then the rest of us were, you know, hired under Chris Hughes, very young, very inexperienced. Um, And so some of my colleagues had news or media hits all the time. And when I got a request to be on your show, I was so excited. I was like, I got a media hit. Somebody wants to talk to me. And then you were so gracious with having me on many times. And it was always such a positive experience. So I, I really learned how to do media hits from from you. Wow. And, with you. And, and so that has helped me tremendously over the years. Well, that's just uh, remarkable to hear you say, because I, I think if I have any talent at all in life in this world, it's finding very intelligent people who are great at communicating and, and, and asking them good questions. And I mean, uh, clearly, you know, you were, I don't know at when, at that point when I was interviewing you, I think you were 12 or 13 years old. I mean, <laughs> I was probably 24. Were you that? Yeah. I mean, I just, I just felt like that you were such then and, and still now even more um, such a young, um, intelligent uh, uh, mature woman who had a lot of experience and obviously a lot of education, but also an original angle with, with which to look at it. And people loved, obviously, when, when we spoke. And it was great to see some some listeners who listened back then, you know, mentioning you on Twitter and copying me. And I was like, you know what? What am I waiting for? I've got I almost maybe thought in my mind that you'd be like too busy or unattainable. It's one of those things. And like maybe she's, you know, she's at the New York Times now. Is she going to, you know, still talk to me? And that's just my own insecurity because the type of guests that I've been able to to get have been great. So I, anyway, I'm psyched to, to reconnect with you. And, it, and it's great to hear that. And I, I really appreciate you saying it. But you've been writing lately a lot about capital punishment. And I, and I want to talk about this because I, I guess I didn't realize it until, until this week. In December, you went to, I didn't know, you went to Indiana and you witnessed the execution of a man at Terre Haute Federal Prison, where I think all federal inmates are are executed now when they are. Mm -hmm. And that piece is so powerful and so important and so moving. And you've been writing about this issue for such a long time that I, I really want to discuss it with you. But I was struck by a tweet of yours where you said, I've been writing about you know, capital punishment, death penalty, whatever you said for, for years. And I wrote about it a lot when I was at the Washington Post, but I feel like I still didn't write about it enough. And I, and that really struck me. Why, why do you feel that way? Why do you think that way about this issue and that it, I guess, deserves more coverage from you and everyone? Well, it's so important. It's so high stakes. I mean, you know, <laughs> you look at the last uh, year and a half of the pandemic, right? Um, and uh, what people are saying, oh, gosh, it's not even been that long. My sense of time is completely distorted, but you know, over the last year, you see the people who've been celebrated in the handling of the pandemic, doctors, first responders, uh, frontline workers. And what people say is true. They say they're saving lives. They're saving lives. And that's true. And there's nothing, there's nothing greater, right? Because every time you save a life, you save the entire world for one person, mm. Right. So, I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous thing. And that's why 
doctors uh, you know are so important and so respected and so well compensated meanwhile there's this class of people in society not a very big one uh, and all they do is try to save lives they are death penalty defense attorneys especially capital habeas lawyers which is lawyers who come in for indigent uh, death row inmates which is basically all of them uh, and they do nothing but labor for years to try to save their lives they they do everything they can about it. And I, I've worked with several of these folks closely now, and they don't just kind of slap down a general defense. They get to know these people. They get to respect them. They come to like them. And they honestly put everything they have into each unique, specific case. And I know this because I've, I've talked to several of them after their clients have been executed, and they're devastated. Mm. Right. And so I, I thought it's so strange that there is this whole machinery of trying to save lives that nobody cares about. And that's because nobody cares about death row inmates. Right. I mean, not nobody. There are lots of people who are activists against the death penalty who are concerned about this. So I don't want to discount their work, which has been incredibly important, too. But uh, this even I guess it's always been important to me um, because of my religion to say the lives you think are worthless are are still human lives. They Ex are still worthwhile. Yeah. Ex explain how your religion instructs that. And we're talking about uh, Catholicism. You were you were raised Methodist, but you were con became a confirmed Catholic in 2014. I mean, according to Wikipedia, but I think that's about right. <laughs> Wikipedia is always right. No, that's true. I was in divinity school. I was overseas at Cambridge getting my master's in Christian theology. Um, and I had been interested in in Augustine in particular for a while. But what I like about Catholicism um, is that there is an honest, semi-compromising at times, sympathy with sinners. And the whole religion is not is not really formed around the sort of maintenance of nice, happy, good, sinless people. It is, it's around the rescue of sinners. I think Pope Francis said, you know, the church is a field hospital for the sick. That's what it is. Communion isn't a reward for the good. It's a uh, medicine for the sick. And so I am really mainly, if not entirely interested in showing the beauty, showing the humanity in, in people who are hard to love, complicated sinners i think they're the most compelling people to me i i agree with that i think i don't know if they're the most compelling people to me i had to have to think about who would be but they certainly are and i i love reading your writing about these specific men who have been executed because y you go into who they're who they are and and talk about you know with the lawyers who are defending them and their cases and there's all of these different layers and there are reasons why people do the things that they do so often i feel like a lot of people say well you, that person was irresponsible they made bad choices and it always uh i always react negatively to to, to someone saying well you just made bad choices I, I never think it's it's about choices it's it's about opportunities or what you even think so often people abuse their kids because they were abused and it's all they know and a lot of people might hear oh, it's all they know and be like well they must know better and Liz, I'm just wondering what you think about that when you hear people say, well, they made bad choices. They they should have made better choices. Then they wouldn't be in this situation. Right. And I'm not. Um, so I, I think about that all the time because, you know, not to get into it, but I have a history there myself. Um, things I experienced as a child. And uh, my sensibility is like, yes, they they made bad choices and I'm not excusing them. My my intent isn't to say that their choices weren't as bad as they seemed or that actually they were justified. That's not what a sinner is. My interest is in saying, but they're still a human being. Nothing you can do can erase your indelible human dignity. And people can say that and have uh, an understanding that philosophically that's true. But what I try to do in my writing is make it viscerally true. Make them human. Show, you know, not tell that they're their indelible human dignity is still intact. I think it's 
really important. I really I, I've been wanting to talk about what's happened um, over the last couple of months with uh, federal executions uh, resuming because I think it's such an important, important issue. And your last few columns have been uh, the best about this. But you, you write um, after a 17 year hiatus, the Department of Justice has resumed federal executions in July wedging 10 deaths into the latter half of the final year of President Trump's term. Two of those inmates, well, um, I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but I guess the fact that there have not been any federal executions for 17 years is something we need to unpack and understand why. But the fact that they were resumed in July is interesting. But more importantly, the fact that several at least now have have taken place after the election, I think, is even more important. I think we can a lot of blame should probably go to DOJ and Bill Barr, who some people are saying nice things about right now. But I think that it's oh, very God. important to just talk about the period after the election and the executions that have been carried out, one of which you witnessed in December. Um, what about that time period? And what about Department of Justice and the federal government resuming executions after 17 years? Well, uh, anyone who's praising Barr because he's a voice of reason or because he owned Trump or whatever, Barr is the architect of this wave of federal executions. He himself pulled it off. What he had to do was, you know, basically twofold. So what had happened was there was a lawsuit filed under Bush, which was questioning the method of execution. This was at the time a three drug cocktail. And what the attorney said at that time was, you know, we can't tell because of this paralytic that's given at the beginning of the of the execution, whether the person is in pain or not, because they can't signal in any way. We don't know if they're in pain and it's needless suffering or if it's if it's just that they're paralyzed. The court said, OK, that's a good point. Let's figure it out. And so there was tons of discovery. It took years and years and years to gather this research. By the time uh, they you know, went back to court for the 10,000th time uh, for more discovery and to, to litigate it a little further, the Obama administration said, you know, we don't really have any interest in litigating this because we don't even have access to the drugs. So what does it matter, right? So a lot of pharmaceutical producers are overseas. They won't sell to America. In fact, Denmark is a pretty big hub. They pointedly won't sell lethal injection drugs to the United States, understandably. Um, and then uh, there are American companies who could produce them who aren't interested. It's a small market and it's bad PR. And there are labs <laughs> that could test them, but they don't want to. Right. So uh, the government was in a bind and the Obama administration, it seems to me, didn't really want to execute anyone. They weren't like hyped up about it. So they said, you know, sorry, we'll just leave this here. And so they kicked the can down the road. Right. At the same time, Obama rejected clemency for many of the people who were executed just now. Interesting. I did not know that. Wow. Yeah. Clemency petitions were submitted to the Obama administration. They were submitted from uh, Corey Johnson, who was intellectually disabled. And uh, they weren't they weren't formally rejected because you can only see clemency once. But uh, essentially what happened was Holder wrote back to the attorneys and was like, I suggest you withdraw it. Because you can only see clemency one time. Wow. So uh, then Trump got into power and Bill Barr was especially eager, I guess, because the death penalty, you know, Trump had said at one point on the campaign trail, we love the death penalty. <laughs> there was an interest in making this happen. So what Bill Barr had to do was get a hold of a new drug. And he did. It's called pentobarbital. And um, when I asked recently the director of the Death Penalty Info Center, well, how did Bill Barr get around this legislation that was still pending, having to do with this original lawsuit filed years and years ago? The Death Penalty Info Center director said, well, he violated it. So what he did was he set a bunch of execution dates oh. and they were uh, the time frames were really short. Um. And so, you know, stays were in place for some of them because of this concern over the use of pentobarbital. Um, but the Supreme Court vacated the stays in the middle of the night last year. 
you know, it brings up a question talking about Bill Barr. You talked about how your religion and your Catholicism informs you on this moral issue. Bill Barr shares your religion in theory. He is a, he's Catholic, right? He was just uh, spoke at Notre Dame with a pretty controversial speech earlier this year. Um, what do you think is the difference in, in, in terms of what he believes and what you believe and why Catholics are divided over this issue in America, much less anywhere else? Well, Catholics, you know, they are um, they're they're divided, split right down the middle politically in the United States. And I think that's because, you know, Catholic priorities are uh, divided, basically, between um, conservative and liberal, right. as we would understand sure. them. So there's the social justice and, and human life component. And then there's, um, you know, the pro-life component and, you know, all of that stuff. So I think depending on what you really feel drawn to, you get peeled in a different right. direction. You end up ignoring the other stuff, more or less. Um, and I, I mean, I try not to do that, um, but I'm sure I'm as guilty of it as anyone. I mean, I'm a big Bernie pro, so... Um, I want to ask you uh, ab- about your experience and, and why you, why did you go to witness the execution of this man? How do I say his last name? Uh, Bo- Bourgeois. Bourgeois. Yeah. Uh, he was from Louisiana. He was a Creole, uh, ah. fellow. I, I had been communicating with Bourgeois attorneys who are just public Alfred defenders, Bourgeois. Public defenders since, um, uh, spring of that year. Mm-hmm. Because they were working on another case I was interested in and am still interested in. This is the case of uh, Ruben Gutierrez in Texas, not a federal, not a federal uh, case. And so um, when I saw this execution come up and I saw that he was one of their clients, I said, you know, I want to write on this. I've already written on Ruben's case. I certainly want it to be a part of what I focus on. Um, because I think it's important. And I think that I can't really say anything from a place of firsthand knowledge as a reporter until I've been through it, right? I want to know what it's like. And so I picked one of the hardest possible cases, right? This man killed his own two-year-old daughter, I have an 18 month old. Mm. They had called his daughter. His name was Jacaran. They called her Jaja. My daughter, Jane, we called her Jaja. Wow. As a baby. And so, um, it was all very familiar the way the little girl died and the degree to which he abused her beforehand were both absolutely heinous. Just very difficult to get your head around a human being doing that. And, uh, I went in not really being sure how I would feel about it. And I was prepared to completely disclose uh, on the page how it turned out. But you know what I found was that after he was dead, she was still dead. Um, Could I ask you to read the end of that piece, which I've put in the chat to make it easier for you Um, in in our Zoom here? Yeah. Because I feel like that's what you wrote in terms of what you just said. Is that too much? Because I'd love to hear you read that. The idea of execution promises catharsis. The reality of it delivers the opposite, a nauseating sense of shame and regret. Alfred Bourgeois was going to die behind bars one way or another, and the only meaning in hastening it, as far as I could tell, was inflicting the terror and the torment of knowing that the end was coming early. I felt defiled by witnessing that particular bit of pageantry, all of that brutality cloaked in sterile procedure. Mm. So much time and effort goes into making executions seem like exercises of justice, not just power. Extreme measures are taken at each juncture to convince the public, and perhaps the executioners themselves, that the process is a fair, dispassionate, rational one. It isn't. There was no sense in it and I can't make any out of it. Nothing was restored. Nothing was gained. There wasn't any justice in it, nor satisfaction, nor reason. There was nothing, nothing there. I love reading your writing, and I love hearing you uh, read your own. Uh, it's, it's so uh, eloquent and so important, that, that part in, in this piece, which everybody can read the entire thing. 
at the New York Times, it's titled The Man I Saw Them Kill. But you also have a very unique and unfortunate perspective in that your sister-in-law was actually murdered. And I think you've also talked openly and written about that. And so often people say, well, what would you do? How would you feel if, if someone murdered someone that you love? Wouldn't you want to see them be put to death for closure? You actually can speak to that and, and you have. Why does, what is your experience? How does it instruct you and, and your husband? Uh, yeah. So uh, her name is Heather. Um, but she, Matt and I all went to the same high school. Um, she was only 18 months older than Matt. Mm. So we were in high school together. Um, and I, you know, I knew her. <laughs> um, she was always at the holidays and uh, at different times throughout the year. We would go to have dinner together, Mexican food, usually at this place in Dallas. Um, and she was great. She was funny. She was a lot like Matt. She was witty. She was quick. She was really tough. Um, she... She was alive. Uh, um, and then I had Jane in 2016. I had my first daughter two weeks after I was laying in bed with her. I just nursed her. We were going to take a nap together. Um, and my my mother was around helping out. She had been shopping with Matt for a business suit to interview in because <laughs> Matt had just been fired for calling near a tand and a scumbag on Twitter. And I'd like to talk um, with him and you about that time and that period for hours in the future. Go ahead. Yes, as one does. And so my mom came in the room and said, you know, I was bare, I was out of it. I was napping and, and I just heard her say, you know, she's dead. And I thought she meant Jane, the baby. And I, I sort of panicked and sat up and I looked at her and she was fine. And my mother said, Heather, Heather is dead. Heather is dead. And I was like, oh, my God, that's terrible. And so then my mom went out. My husband came in. He was ashen mm. and devastated. Mm. And I I said, was it an, an accident, like a car accident? And he said, no, she was murdered. And um, she was stabbed to death in her trailer. I've, I've read a lot of stuff documents wise in my day as a journalist i've read clergy personnel reports that contain graphic descriptions of, of clergy molestation of children i've read uh entire police reports sexual assault nurse examiners reports on the rape of of teenagers of kids i read jacaran's autopsy uh i mean i've just i've been through it yeah. a bit on Photographs I've seen, and then, you know, I've seen a man killed right in front of me. Um, I requested the police records on Heather's murder. I, I couldn't read them. I couldn't finish. Mm. Um, I couldn't finish that. And so I fully understand being a part of a victim's family. My husband left. He went to Texas to sort out her funeral and also to ask the prosecutors not to pursue the death penalty. And it turned out to be, um, not, it didn't have all the elements of a capital case. We didn't know that right at first, but, um, he, he wanted to emphasize that's not something the family wanted. Um, and part of it was just because he knew as a lawyer, if it were a capital case, they would be dealing with it for years. Right. And he just wanted it to be something they could put in its proper place as already adjudicated, resolved, so they could, you know, heal and move on. And I think that's one of the greatest demonstrations of sort of moral strength I've ever seen. And it inspired me and it made me want to carry on that, that fight. And you have, and you've been writing about it extensively and, and, and did the actual journalism to go and, and witness this execution. And you've also been writing uh, about how the laws work and where they come from. And I think that's super important and fascinating. You had a great Twitter thread last night about the Oklahoma City bombing and how that affected your mother who worked in a federal building in Dallas and how security changed and how it stays with you. And it was brilliant. 
and uh, important. I think everybody should read the whole thing, but I want to ask you about it because after the Timothy McVeigh uh, murdered uh, over 100 people, including several kids in in, in the Mira Federal Building in, in 19, what year was it that it happened? 93? Um, 95. 95, forgive me. And then after 9-11, uh, there were new laws passed, and you connect this all to what happened two weeks ago in terms of the insurrection and the idea that a lot of uh, legal experts have been making for a long time that I kind of, up until reading your stuff, was was buying into that we needed new laws to prosecute domestic terrorism. And then reading your articles and the experts that you spoke to enlightened me so much more. So take us down a little history in terms of what happened after the Oklahoma City bombing uh, uh, occurred in in Congress and then President Clinton, because they passed laws there. They passed laws after 9-11 that everybody's probably even more familiar with. And now, obviously, people are talking about, you know, how do we uh, prosecute the insurrectionists uh, from a couple of weeks ago? What's important for people to know about this? Well, uh, you know, I think everybody probably knows about the Patriot Act, right, that we had 9-11 and then we had this complete disaster for civil liberties. Um, that followed in the form of the Patriot Act. That's why there's, you know, a guy in the FBI listening to all our conversations right now. Um, well, I hope so. Another listener. Yeah, we we always joke, my husband and I, that uh, <laughs> maybe the FBI guy who listens to us talk all day with some bug in our house or whatever has become a fan of the Brunigs. <laughs> we hope he's friendly. We say nice things about him. Um but uh, we'll also be like, this is strictly in a parody sense for the FBI mole who's listening. It's strictly parody here. Um, but uh, what's his name? Um, what do you guys call him around the house? We just say FBI guy. <laughs> you should we give him a name. Anything. He's a human he's be- with a name. I know. I know. You know, anytime he'd like to come over, you know, you know where I am. Just <laughs> yeah. pop over for some dinner. You know what I like to um, eat and even more importantly, um, like what I like to make. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Absolutely. You know where my skills are. Um, so, uh, EDPA, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, was the Patriot Act before the Patriot Act. So, in 1995, um, you had a Democratic president, Clinton, Republican Congress, led by Gingrich, um, and you were in a moment where the Democrats were trying to establish that they were tough on crime, that they were just as hard-assed as the Republicans, that they weren't hippies. It was, it's hard to overstate how invested the Democratic Party was at that period in demonstrating that they weren't far left. Okay. So the Oklahoma City bombing happens. 168 people are killed. A lot of them children's very iconic news photographs come out of that. It's extraordinarily moving and people are furious, rightfully so. Also, Tim McVeigh is an unrepentant asshole and the, the whole trial is a, is a circus. Um, And uh, this was an opportunity that Gingrich used, more or less, to say, uh, take this death penalty legislation that was just going to make it harder for uh, death row inmates to appeal their sentences. This was already percolating. It was something the Republicans had wanted to do for a minute. And... When this happened, they just tacked on uh, some anti-terrorism crimes. There were some new crimes created, like the material support statute um, and some relief for victims of terrorism. They slapped that together with this death penalty stuff, cranked it right through Congress. Clinton signed it happily. What it did was it, it set a time limit on appealing one's sentence. It created this standard of deference in federal courts to state courts so that even if the state courts had royally screwed up a trial in a demonstrable way, that was nothing near a guarantee you were going to get a a second shot at it. Which is crazy. You should get a second shot at it. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there was the case that I opened the piece with is a guy who murdered a neighbor or he was party to the murder of a neighbor when his dad killed his neighbor in a trailer park in Texas Um, And then he went to prison and they found a guard stabbed to death, accused him of doing it uh, (laughs) because a disciplinary report about him trying to take his sack lunch into chow or whatever the recreation yard was was torn up around the guard's body. The problem was none of this person 
uh, Robert Pruitt was his name. None of Robert's DNA was on the guard. None of his DNA was on the weapon. None of his DNA was even on the torn up disciplinary report. No DNA of his was ever recovered. And the people who implicated him, the other guards who, who said, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely this guy, yeah. were later busted for running a drug smuggling <laughs> and, and money laundering ring with inmates in the prison. Uh, and all of it didn't matter. Right. It's such a, an important story. I'm so glad I had no idea who this guy was until I read your piece. It's in today's uh, it's New York Times dot com. The Fire Last Time by Elizabeth Brunig. And it's so important because of what you're what you're saying about what these laws do and what Gingrich and others have slid in these masses, uh, massive pieces of legislation um, to make things worse for people who did not commit terrorist acts. And um, and you detail it so well. And I think that's why it's so important. Most people have no idea. I certainly didn't know about this, which is what uh, what changed my mind on the idea that we need new laws, because I think the shortest way of saying a lot of what you've been writing is enforce the laws we have on the books for these people. I hear a lot of people saying that. Do you agree with that? Or is there more a lot more nuance that needs to be? Absolutely. They're already arresting and charging these people with tons of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. If you if you follow the news, there's a girl who was going to like hawk Nancy Pelosi's laptop to the KGB or whatever. Uh, she was, the feds got her yesterday. Uh, the feds got the Viking guy, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. The shaman. Yeah. yeah. He's um, gone. He's going to be gone know, for a while. They have video recordings of all of these people. They, they no scoped a woman right in the Capitol, right? Ashley Babbitt was just killed right there. Um, you know, point blank range. And um, I think it's pretty clear the feds are not going to struggle whatsoever to put these people away for very, very long time. And I don't think we need new laws. I think we need to repeal EDPA, right? Because it, it certainly didn't stop the right wing extremism, you know, and people have said, well, there was not another uh, mass casualty event there wasn't more right-wing terrorism after edpa so you, you have to admit it did something um there was plenty more right-wing terrorism yeah. after edpa it was just done with guns instead of bombs and but it's still terrorism even if it's dylan roof murdering people in uh, an african-american church well just because i mean you you wrote about this but not we have to r remove that law edpa is the acronym uh but we also be because it hasn't stopped right wing uh, terrorism or terrorism. But also the other part of that is we have to remove it because of what it is done to so many of these people on death row, which is preventing them from seeking uh, justice in so many ways and creating harsher penalties for their crimes. That's the other most important part that you've written so much about why this law needs to be repealed, because it's punishing people who did not commit terrorist acts in any way. That's right. Um, and, you know, we all know about posthumous exonerations, right? People who are exonerated after they're killed. Um, and those are very, they're horrible By the state. Yeah, by the state. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but, but what I am saying is I think there's very good reason to believe that there are many, many more people who have mm. been executed for stuff they didn't actually do than ever show up in studies. I attended, I was in the audience at the Intelligence Squared debate on the death penalty, and I've always been uh, you know, virulently against the death penalty. I've never understood it and never supported it in my entire life. But the guy was arguing for it, basically. He, he, he argued really well. He almost convinced me. But the, the one point, Liz, that they were hinging on is disagreeing on what percent of people had been put, in, put to death uh, wrongly. Innocent, how many innocent people had been put to death? And the guy arguing against the death penalty said it's about 4%. The guy arguing for it said it's only about 1%. And then at one point he said, well, if it were 4%, would you agree with me? And the guy for the death penalty said, yes, if it was that high, I would agree with you. And I thought that was the most fascinating point that they were disagreeing on, A, the statistics, and B, if it were 3% more, then yeah, then I think it would be wrong. But I'll just never forget that moment because it is the most important point. Most people will agree that putting innocent people to death by the state is is wrong. I think that's pretty clear to say. I think that, you know, one point I always make when that topic comes up is most people 
if not all of them, or, you know, a, a vast super majority on death row did something, but they might not have done what they were given the death sentence for. So uh, if you look at Alfred Bourgeois's case, yeah. he was, uh, you know, convicted of murdering his daughter. And something that the prosecution really hammered at his trial was that semen had been found in her anus, right, in her rectum. And uh, the lawyers said, and I read the trial transcripts, and it seemed to me that's what killed him, right? That's what moved this from something that could be interpreted as like the impulsive shaking death of a baby, which is horrible and, and absolutely unforgivable, but happens not infrequently, unfortunately, right. in cases of child abuse. That's what moved it to a level of just a diabolical sexual torture right. and murder. Uh, and so, you know, that seems to have been what moved the jury towards capital punishment pretty definitively. The thing is, the there are three components to a semen test, right? One is for actual sperm. That's the most confirmatory, you know, the sperm cells are there. You've almost certainly got semen. Right. Um, one is for an acid phosphatase. Um, but the protein P30 that they found in the girl's rectum, um, and they found no sperm cells. They found none of Alfred's DNA, right? It, it, you know, you think, okay, they have semen. Did they try to make a DNA match? They did try and there was nothing there. Mm. Only the little girl's DNA. That's curious. Um, and so the thing is, P30 is actually a chemical that's made in, in the human body, male and female, all throughout the body. And this was subsequently discovered. And uh, as a result, the FBI no longer uses P30 as a, as a positive semen test. It's, getting that result doesn't actually tell you anything. Even the FBI recognizes that now. Um, so, you know, he may not have been... Um, an innocent person, right? He definitely killed her. I think that's hard to dispute. But he also may not have been guilty of what killed him. I think it's so important that you wrote about that, and I appreciate you mentioning all of those details right here, because the, the, the important point is how, in the in the court of public opinion or in people's general moralities, that it's one thing to to for to shake your kid to death violently. It's another can a whole other thing to have any kind of sexual anything uh with a child uh, that and that changes the the way that we react and how we support the death penalty you write in this piece that his last words which uh which you witnessed were i did not commit this crime i asked god to forgive all those who plotted and schemed against me and planted false evidence and he also added that he had never raped or sexually molested anyone ever in his entire life and so all of those details are important, and you write so eloquently about all of uh, these issues and, and cases in so much more. Now in the New York Times, I've been very selfish with your time. You have a job, two small kids, and I think plenty of delicious things to, to make and bake, which you've shared on your Twitter feed, which have gotten me through a couple of hard moments. So thank you so much for, for joining me, and let's ple- I, I'll do it again anytime. I love talking to you. I love reading you, and it's great anytime. to reconnect with you, Liz. Anytime. Talk to you soon. Well, how about that? I cannot tell you. I wish I could articulate it differently. I always feel like I say the same type of thing. I can't tell you how much I highly recommend that you read her stuff. That's a a phrase I feel like I overuse here on the show and throughout my career. But I guess it's what I do to prepare for these interviews. And I so thoroughly enjoyed reading Liz Brunig in the New York Times. I highly recommend that you check out her whole byline, especially... The story about the visit to watch that poor man uh, be executed. I say poor man because I don't think anybody should be executed, no matter how heinous the crimes they are uh, they have committed. I've, I've, I've never felt any other way other than that. I highly recommend the Intelligence Squared debate hosted by John Donvan on the death penalty to learn more about it and all of the arguments surrounding it. Okay, so next, oh, by the way, uh, Liz Brunig is on Twitter at E Brunig, E B R U E N I G. Okay, so I'm doing this thing with my friend Pam Keith, who's launched her own show called Pete and Pam, or Pam and Pete, doesn't matter. But like on Sunday nights, we chat for about 30 minutes about the week uh, that uh, was before and the week that was after. And it's been fun. We've done it for two weeks. And Sunday night, after we got done, 
I decided I wanted to test out my, my, my thoughts and my theories on some things to Pam and her producer who was there on the, the Zoom chat as well. His name is Mari. Mari Sally is the co-founder of the nonprofit organization United Progressive Platform at We Think Up with two P's. And his Twitter is at R.A. Marion 85. At R.A. Marion 85 is Mari's Twitter. And we had a, a, a very interesting conversation, as one always does when Pam Keith is in it. And Pam, of course, was the congressional candidate, Democratic Party nominee for Congress in Florida's 18th congressional district. She did not win But we had a lot of conversations and got close through her campaign. She's also a former United States Navy JAG officer, a a litigator, and an expert on pretty much everything. And I mean, she can talk about so many different things, and I love chatting with her. So we just had this casual chat that I hadn't prepared for, and I I, I ran my theories by him. And I don't know how good it is because I do too much talking, especially here at the top. But I definitely wanted to share it with you because I learned a lot from it getting their perspective, and I thought you might as well. Here now my conversation with Mari Sally and Pam Keith. So I just, I have to run this by black people before I say it, just into a microphone without black people. Right. If you will. What's, there should be a name for that. Um, black testing. Checking in. Black testing. Black testing. Che- checking, a, checking a theory. Yep. Today I heard Chuck Todd on Meet the Press say that this threat that we this insurrection and everything that has been wrought uh, Mm -hmm. was basically hiding in plain sight were his words. And I immediately got outraged, just real triggered, like because because I've been doing media. I've been in the media for 15 years and I yeah, I worked at a corporate media, Sirius XM, and I had a certain amount of resources, but I certainly didn't have the resources of meet the press and NBC (laughs) News meaning, you know, but if you interview the head of the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, if you interview the head of NAACP, if you interview the people at Southern Poverty Law Center, scholars on white supremacy, you see the threat, you saw the threat, and then if you just looked at statistics of terrorism, you see how many are white nationalists, anti-government. It was always the case before and after 9-11 that white, domestic, anti-government, white nationalist types so I'm almost done talking with my theory. But again, this is I got to just bounce this mm-hmm. off you guys. So then Chuck Todd later then said what began with the Tea Party, which was mm-hmm. which was he talked about the the fiscal concerns that they had, you know, the debt and deficit and government spending. He, he talked about that. Then I got even more triggered because I'm like, Chuck Todd has been missing this corporate media, not just Chuck, they, they've all been missing this because they're dominated by white male executives and white male hosts. And if you're a white male person, especially if you're a white person and you don't really talk with black folks on any kind of regular basis or throughout your life in any kind of private or intimate way, and then you're not interviewing them on your shows as experts, then yeah, you missed the boat. But I'd been doing that and living that for so long that it was it outraged me that he said it's been hiding in plain sight and that the Tea Party was a reaction to some fiscal concerns when, in fact, that was a reaction to the black guy being president. Yeah. It was so obvious it's simply because their party. call, their mantra was take our country back. And I would always answer right. from who. So, Mari, uh, you're new to my conversation. So I want you to react to uh, what I said and how you would hear that as a black man in America. The Tea Party was always the birther party. It, it, it had absolutely nothing. I remember when Mark Meadows ran and the first thing out of his mouth was Obama's not American. Um, Tea Party had nothing to do with fiscal, fiscal conservatism. It was always about taking their country back from the black man who won, period. And that has just continued on and they have been doing nothing but running more people who are more extreme and taking more and more from the Republican Party. And the Republican Party has seen how that has, you know, taken a hold of people and route people up. And they've written it until just this week where they realized, you know what, that was probably a bad idea. But the problem is, is now the genie's out of the bottle. Mm. You can't put that back in as much as they're trying to. 
Well, well, to the point um, about so, media, though. So when you hear Chuck Todd say, and just specifically answer this, and then Pam, I want you to specifically answer this one, say whatever yeah. else you want to what I said. When you hear him say, it's been hiding in plain sight, and, and uh, it, has the mainstream kind of corporate network media missed what has always been happening in this country? Well, yes. Mari first, and then, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Mari. That's the answer, yes. They've <laughs> always been missing it, and the problem is is that most of the people in those seats the meet the presses and the the ab and you know, george the Stephanopoulos, face the nations that, the 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 weeks the, the networks yeah yeah they're all in a bubble they're, they're not at all connected to everyday people right. who have everyday interactions with trump which is why they did so many pieces on oh what are trump voters thinking because they have no connection to it they don't know they're they're all right. kind of tucked away in their their corporate offices and high rises, and they don't really get a chance to see what's actually happening on the ground. From Pam, my perspective. Pam, the same I question to you. To I have two things to say. Uh, Mari, would you do me a favor and put a pin on what you just said about they don't, they are not exposed to it. They don't, I want to come back to that one in a minute. But I want to okay. say this. What we have in our country is, is this, um, this convention of, always accepting at face value a plausible deniability a plausibly deniable set of work choices mm. Mm -hmm. that are designed to hide an intention that everybody in the room understands and we call it dog whistling right but the people uttering the words understand what they really mean the people listening to the words understand what they really mean and the people attacked by the words understand what they really mean. And corporate America says, but we are not going to say any of that. We're going to hang out on the top of it and give it some kind of imprimatur of legitimacy. And, and so all of these concepts all came down to the same thing. And if you're black, you always knew it. States' rights was always about Jim Crow and segregation, right? right? And we had this huge national conversation about the federalism, and whether or not, you know, what was left of the states when the government is encroaching and government is overreaching and all of this. And every black person I know always understood that that was code for we want to discriminate against black people. And we don't like it when the federal government stops us from doing so. That's the only context in which they give a shit about states' rights, except for now, you know, maybe gun rights is a second area mm -hmm. where they give a shit about states' rights. But trust and believe that, that they never actually gave a shit about states' rights because we know this, because when Donald Trump became president, all of a sudden states didn't matter at all, right? There was like, right. you know, how, right? They, the judge state, the hell, we got an authoritarian that we love. Fuck a state, right? Like, so right. we, but we knew that that was always about discriminating against black people. And the same thing was true about fiscal responsibility. Fiscal right. responsibility was code for we don't like our money going to help black people survive. Right. And we institutionalize poverty and we create red lines and all these structural things that prohibit black people from acquiring and transitioning wealth. We make sure that they go to the worst kinds of schools. We under-resource their communities. We do infrastructure everywhere but in black communities. And then when, it, when all of those intentional choices to treat jack, black people as second-class citizens have the concomitant consequence that we intended, mm. which is they live a worse life and they struggle to get jobs and so forth, then we get resentful that we need our tax dollars to help feed those children and help get them across the line. So... We always knew that fiscal responsibility was never really about responsibility at all. It was about hoarding wealth and keeping it away. They don't want white dollars supporting black people. And that's definitely the dog whistle of Ronald Reagan and what he what he sold with the whole welfare mothers and pull yourself up by your bootstraps when we always knew that you didn't give us fucking shoes. So stop talking about bootstraps. Yeah. And the other right? thing that the other really important thing I wanted to just bounce at you both is the other thing that, that it's just not lost on black people. And I think it's absolutely lost in the vast majority of white people, even well-meaning, well-intentioned people, because it's a matter of geography and culture. And that's this. Republicans, especially President Trump, uh, have specifically been talking about the cities and the states 
uh, where predominantly black people live and voted as the states that cheated. And they've been doing this, by the way, with cities like Philadelphia forever. Philadelphia, Milwaukee. Uh, and Detroit. so right. the, the election was yeah. stolen by <laughs> black people in black states is what I'm just is what black people are hearing. All what most white right. people don't even realize that that's what is being said and I, I i really don't think they do but i think black people realize that because black people know that where other black people know where other black people live and white people really don't well, I mean, that again, <laughs> but i will tell you this what, no, what white people show up to atlanta but like well there's a lot of black people here in atlanta <laughs> right, but, but see but pete that's just it we've always understood when Sarah Palin first trotted out and said, I'm so glad to be here with the real Americans. That, you know, yeah, all of us right. black people completely understood what she was saying. The yeah. reason so real many Real Americans, people, Heartland, all those things that, that never uh, sound like uh, you're talking about black people. No, I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> we always knew that white people believe that black people are less citizens and should not have a say in the governance of this country in the way white people do. And they resent it. And so that is why so many Trumpers believe it was stolen. It's not because they actually believe that fraud happened. It's that when black people vote, they think that act in itself is illegitimate and fraudulent because it should have never happened in the first place. That is their beef. The problem is you can't go into a court of law and say, throw these votes out. Okay, so prove the fraud. And it's like, well, it happened in Milwaukee. It's fraudulent. Right. That just doesn't stand up in court. And so they yeah. feel like they've been betrayed by the judges who should have sided with yeah. them to simply accept that when black people vote, it's fraudulent because they're not real Americans and not real citizens. So these are the dog whistles. This is why Doug, you know, Chuck Todd, like the, the thing that I have is that we the, the mainstream media absolutely gives legitimacy and cover to these dog whistles. They do talk yeah. about states' rights and they do talk about fiscal responsibility and they do talk about, you know, fraud and election fraud and all this stuff in a way as if it wasn't about targeting black people and hurting black people when every black person knows that that's what it's about. The people who utter it know that that's what it's about and the people who hear it know what it's about. And so that's that's the thing that I have a problem with. And Mark, I just Thank want to get back to that one thing that you yeah. said. And of course, now I forgot what it was. No, when, when you it was were talking. about them all being in a bubble. Uh, and not really uh, having the same connections. And you mean in court, people working in corporate media and newsrooms yes, and high rises in D.C. and in New so York. So many stories on what Trumpers are feeling and why they're feeling so. You know, sometimes it felt like, oh, they were just looking at that inexplicable car crash kind of thing. But no, the reason they were always doing stories about that is because they're always centering the mood of white people. Mm. By they the way, that's the name of my new show. That America is the mood of white people. Yeah, centering the mind of white people with Pete Dominic is the name of my new show. Uh, I do have, I, I do have one more uh, question that needs to be asked to black people, and it is when you, when I look at uh, history of America, and I look at the kind of the the pro slave movement, and then you look at the abolitionist movement that rose as a result of it. I side with the abolitionist movement or the anti-slave movement. It seems pretty, uh, pretty obvious. But then you move on to Reconstruction and you move on to Jim Crow and you move on to leaders in the civil rights, quote, civil rights era. And you think of Dr. King and you think of John Lewis and so many others, uh, Shirley Chisholm and so many others. Uh, and, and you say, I'm siding with that movement because what they want are more rights, equal rights, voting rights, uh, ending desegregation. Okay, and most of history looks back and says, yeah, that was Martin Luther King. Most people see as a, as a very popular uh, American. And then when you see the Black Lives Matter movement, to me, the Black Lives Matter movement gets a lot of credit like that it's this brand new thing. But it's the civil rights movement continued in the 21st century. It's the same right. thing that I started with anti-abolitionists, the anti-Jim Crow South, and all of the civil rights leaders. That's what Black Lives Matter is. So when you look no, at Black Lives Matter, oh, I'm wrong. You're wrong. Okay. Well, my point was, you if you look, if you're against Black Lives Matter and you're calling them anything from terrorists no, 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 to... No, no, no. I am very for Black Lives Matter. No, no, I'm not saying are... that. I'm saying the same people were against, uh, were for slavery. The same people were against yeah, the civil rights movement in the 60s. And the same people are against 
And at some point you look at history, like which side? Uh, clearly, this is a movement for civil rights. What am I missing? It is. It, but, but, but Pete, there's something there's a very important distinction which makes Black Lives Matter different. And I want to get to that in a moment. But you're right. What we are seeing in Trumpism is Confederacy 2.0. I mean, that's basically it. But. I want to make something very clear about what makes Black Lives Matter materially different. In all of those other movements, it was Black people asking white people to treat them better, to give them rights. But the mere act of asking white people that, it still centers them. If I ask you for a slice of cake, I still work in a paradigm where the cake is yours and I'm asking Mm. you to give me a slice. What makes Black Lives Matter so different and so destabilizing is that they're marching and saying, hey, the cake ain't yours. The cake has always been ours. We're taking the cake. We're making the cake. All of us are in agreement that all of us are sharing the cake. And if you got a problem with that, you get to not have any cake. And it is that that is really frightening to people. Yeah, but that's all right. But that's always been centered in America. And that's that's all true. But it's still what I'm saying is it's an evolution. It's an evolution of the same movement, which is you're saying, you know, equal rights. But Mari, let me get in here for one final word from you on, on anything I just said about this continued movement and about if you see it. And you reject it or you name it as negative, the Black Lives Matter movement, then aren't you saying the same thing about Dr. King and the anti abolitionists? And I mean, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. You are. You are. But here's another thing that we're fighting against, you know, we have against us, and that's education. And a lot of textbooks, a lot of, you know, uh, historical writing, so on and so forth, they spin the story of slavery, you know, Jim Crow, all of that stuff. Which is why you have people right now like Tom Cotton trying to go up against the, the 1619 project so that, again, they can morph it so that the next generation of people learn something that's incorrect again. And, and that's part of America's problem. The media does play a big part of that. Chuck Todd and all these people who are journalists never sit down and learn about these things enough So that when this comes up the next time, they can say, no, that's not true. And and, and be factual. There's enough writing out there for somebody to say, now, we were wrong 15 years ago and 20 years ago and 25 years ago and 30 years ago. But nobody ever does it. They just all act surprised and say, oh, this isn't America. Right. (laughs) This isn't who we are. This isn't who we are. This isn't who we are. What do black people hear when white people say this isn't who we are? What is the what do black people hear? Go ahead. I would say that it's exactly who we are. 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 (laughs) But but that doesn't necessarily mean we are all bad. I mean, I think this problem, I think there's this problem where people take resent being confronted with the bad parts of America because they feel like it blocks their ability to have national pride or to love, you know, love their family, their history, their country, be patriotic. I'm patriotic as hell. No, you can have 10 ideas in your head at once about a person, much less a country. It doesn't. Yeah, but you got to be honest about that person. Like, you know, he's he's really annoying. He talks way too much, but he's generous as hell, way more generous than I am. I mean, like, that's how you think about people. That's how you think about your spouse. To think bad things about your country. I love that you're saying that, Pam, because that is the raw psychology. I had to unlearn that stuff. I had to unlearn a lot of that stuff that I had learned from in so many different ways. But that's why I love that you brought up education as well, Mari. I mean, like, but that's the thing. White people don't have an education based on our life. We don't have an experience to draw from. That's why it's important to uh, talk to black, to listen to black people. Like call, call them like, hi, here, I have a few questions for you. And if you're worried that your question it might come off as racist or bigoted or ignorant. It's fine. Ask it. Just ask it. It's fine. Like this. Here's one. Hey, guys, let's talk about skin cream. I feel <laughs> like we're not. I feel like we don't shop in the same aisle. Am I right? Probably. <laughs> well, not necessarily. I mean, I, I, you know, uh, I, look, I got my own skincare secrets. Um, but I will say this, Pete. Pam's got some kind of like yeah. salmon Dijon mustard that she rubs on her. I don't know what you were just talking about, but it made me think that you have some no, kind of I mean, jar like in the fridge called Pam's skin you know? stuff. 
But but I will go back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier when I said, look, there is something that is materially different. It's you're right. It is an outgrowth of all of the previous movements, but there is something categorically different. And it is so because we and this is what's causing the panic, Pete. What's causing the panic is that the Gen Z that is that is owning the and leading this Black Lives Matter movement is not working from a paradigm of centering white people. Right, yeah, it's and upsetting. what's scaring <laughs> them. That is yes. destabilizing. Yep, them. I hear well, you. I, I also think technology plays a part in that too. And we have a lot more tools and resources to put things out into the universe for people to then be confronted with. And then it makes that conversation a little bit different as well. Whereas before, you know, there was a you had, there was a lot of work to convince somebody of your position. Well, now it's like it's on camera, it's streaming live, it's you know. Do you have <laughs> do you I think that's such a great point and do you have any kind of grace or not grace like like uh um understanding of of well-intentioned white people who are really sure. waking up. Hold on, let me just who are really trying to be curious, but the bottom line is you can read books, you can watch documentaries and that's great. Good for you. But I've, my experience and my feelings on race are mostly instructed by my relationships with people of color throughout my life, mostly just conversations, experiences, everything. And what's interesting is in this virtual world that we live in and the community that I've created, especially it's interesting to watch white people who don't have access or comfort with, cause you might work with a black guy at work, but you don't want to ask him a question cause it's work. And so it's really interesting to see white people who live in predominantly white places who've been grown up around predominantly white people, ask the black people on the zoom a question. They're genuinely curious. And it's just fascinating watching people have access to people with not only black, like other ethnicities, other whatever it might be, some kind of disability, mm -hmm. and to ask questions. You don't have access because you don't work with them. You don't go to church with them. You right. don't live in that community. Right. And then virtually all of a sudden there's these black faces like, hey, Pam, uh, you know, tell me something about whatever that I don't know. And I really I think that's fantastic. Do you have kind of a what is your thought about that, Mari? Um, be you know, you're like being a token black person to white people in a weird kind of way. You're like it's kind of like black people ask me anything, but I think it's important. I really do because they're trying. They just don't know anybody. Yeah, I mean, I moved to um, Gilbert, Arizona, in fourth grade, and so the majority of my friends were not black. Um, so I kind of feel like I've been in that role my entire life. Mm -hmm. where you have some people who definitely want to do the right thing, definitely want to be better than their parents and grandparents and will come to you and they'll ask you questions and I have no problem doing it. Now, I know for some folks, it's exhausting. Yeah, it's not your responsibility, but it's like... You, you want them to take responsibility and do some research on their own before they come to you, which yeah. some people don't do, even though they're well-intentioned they have absolutely zero research done on their own before they come to you. Right. Um, but I have no problem with it. I actually prefer it because from my perspective, if you're dealing with me, my, my, my upbringing, my positioning, my outlook is different than the next, you know, person. We're not all the same. Uh, um, so for me, I can tell you how I feel about certain things that you get to know me better on specific topics. Well, I would say, um, you know, you know, it's funny when whenever we talk and I want you to answer the same question, Pam, but whenever we talk about the black experience, someone always has to say, well, we, it's not monolithic. We don't all share the same experience. But I do think that when it comes to being in a black body, there is a similar experience. And so sometimes right, it, I is. think it throws us off. I grew up like, let's say if you're black and you grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood and your black parents were affluent CEOs. That's a different experience. But the moment you're not in that neighborhood or you're not right. recognized or you're not in a suit or all that, that yeah. to me sounds like a black experience that is monolithic. Pam, how do you feel yeah. about you've been I educating mean, the whites your whole life? How do you feel about it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm a little bit older than Mari. No, I'm a lot older than Mari. So there are many, 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 many places in my life and chapters in my life where I was the only the first, you know, um, black person. That Pam was an in intern in the Lincoln administration. <laughs> um, but so I had a lot of experiences being the, the, the ambassador of black people 
to whatever entity or place that I was, you know, I mean, I was a jag, you know, black woman, jag, like, you know, like these jag, are very, uh, uh, lawyer, military lawyer. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I had that role. Was that all, were, were there any other black women? There's some black women, a few, There were, but I mean, in the Navy, yes. Yeah. Anywhere on my base or anywhere in where I was. No, none. Like there's like 15 or 20 black women, Jags and all the entire Navy. Wow. Right. So, hmm. So that's, you know, obviously very a, a unique experience. Like I was the first black woman officer that a lot of the people enlisted people ever saw. Wow. Period. Of any flavor. Um, so, you know, it's just, a, it, you know, I've, it's been the, the, the nature of my life. Um, to be, you know, the first, the only, the ambassador, the person who fields the questions and educates people. And, and I've always had a very open and kind of uh, um, happy, happy to answer your questions and don't assume, I, I make a safe space um, and I don't get my back up easily. I make a safe space for people to ask those questions to feel comfortable to asking me those questions. But I will say this, um, that even the way that I explain it for folks that don't know is that black people do not have... Um, an identical experience, but they always have an identifiable experience. Oh, I so like that way you're splitting the hairs. That's what I was trying to say. Right, 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 right. And I always feel that that is, in fact, the greatest source of our power. The source of right. black power is the sort of uh, redlining of Jim Crow that made the laws apply to us uniquely differently than they apply to everybody else. And so it created a community of interest. And this is very different. I was talking about this just yesterday with my um, uh, my cool ass people you should know show about the the different experience of black people in Jamaica or, for example, Brazil or, for example, South right, Africa. Right. Right. Totally different. And, and that is why black people in the United States have actually gotten so much more in a lot of ways um, than black people in Brazil or South the Africa. The diaspora. Right. Did I pronounce it right? And the diaspora. Right? Diaspora. Because- Son of a bitch. God, I was thinking of the soccer cleats. Well, let me hold on. Can we just play a game then at the at the lightning round? Sure. Okay. Sure. So we've been you, 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 we, the basically what I've been getting at here is asking black folks, you know, white people asking uh, black people things. Listening. Be a white man. If you're a white guy, listen. If you're a guy, listen to women. If you're white, listen to black folks. Just listen and ask questions. Ask whatever questions you want. That's kind of and and it's really important. Whether no matter what job you have uh, or what uh, where you live. But now let's reverse it. This is called the whitest blank, you know, I'm going to name, I'm going to say a word and you're going to say the whitest, whatever. And, um, I'm going to switch back and forth with who goes first. So one person always gets longer to think of it. Okay. I'll Mm -hmm. put some fun music behind this in post-production. I probably won't. Here we go. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Mari, you are up first. What is the whitest state in America? Whitest state. You're on the clock. Three. To uh, Vermont. Vermont. Pam, why does state in America? Utah. Okay. Uh, the next question yeah, goes to. I'm sorry, you had commentary there, Mari. I said she got me on that one. Oh, okay. Utah is All right. You're giving. State. You're giving up. We don't. <laughs> by the way, there are no wrong or right answers, and there are no statistics. <laughs> These are just your feelings about the white, the whites. Sure. Uh, Pam, ready? Mm-hmm. Why does sport? Skiing. Mari. Hockey. Mari, what is the widest band of all time? Music band. Mari, widest band. The Grateful Dead? Wrong, it's the Beatles. Um, no, I don't know anything about music, and that's probably wrong. I, I was, uh, Pam? Kiss. Oh, say kiss oh that's that's <laughs> but that's weird because they did blackface. Good call. OK, kind of. Um, let's be honest. Right. OK, <laughs> who was for a uh, Pam, the whitest food, a food that seems like it's a white person food. Whitest food. Mm. Can't say mayonnaise. I'm sorry. Mayonnaise. You can't say it. I'm sorry. You can't say mayonnaise. You can't say white bread. They're too obvious. Try again. Okay. Sorry. I will say I will say. Um, uh, Fruit salad. That's sound. That's awful. Um, that that's ours, really. Okay, all right. No wrong answers except for mayonnaise and white bread. Apparently, like ambrosia fruit salad. With like, uh, you yeah. can't add anything to it now. I'm so sorry. You had your chance, and it was deeply offensive. Um, okay, whitest f- 
food, Mari? What is food? Uh, I would have to say... This one's not easy, apparently. Um, okay. This is tough. Why does food is hard? hard. I'm surprised. I thought you guys would... No, I mean, when you take out mayonnaise, that's pretty tough. (laughs) That's not even... Uh, I I can definitely say the way things are, you know, prepared. I've had a a horrible white gravy at at Thanksgiving from a white family. Uh, (laughs) Wait, was it a white... (laughs) Wait, now we're all confused. Was the gravy white or was it a brown gravy gravy made by the whites? And it had hard-boiled eggs in it. It was the worst white gravy I have ever had. Oh, my God. Oh my god, that just grossed me out right there. Okay. Uh, I was going to say pumpkin pie because most black people eat sweet potato pie. Oh, that's that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, we don't we don't usually do the pumpkin. Okay. We do the well, this is the whitest blank you know. Um, mm-hmm. So that's the. But finally, what is the whitest male name, Mari? Whitest male name, a name that only a white guy could have, and it can't be like ethnic, like German, like Gunther or some shit like that. That the obvious. It's got to be like an American I name, know. like. Whatever, I'm not going to say any. Whitest name, you've never known a black person or even, you know, mix nothing even remotely with any melanin could ever have this name go. Ah, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, no, I've known. That's tough. It's a tough one. Uh, Do you know any black chads? I mean... Oh, there's a, a, a Bengals uh, receiver, Chad uh, something. Chad John? Yeah, Chad ah, Johnson. shit. All right. I'll come um, back to you. Uh, Pam? Tough, tough. Todd. I know some Todds. <laughs> that is all the time we have for the whitest thing you know. Thank you guys very much. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I had a really fun time talking with Pam and Mari, and you can follow Mari on R A M A R I O N 85. It's linked in the show notes, of course, at Pam Keith F L. That's Pam Keith. Always great to have them and check out Pam and Pete. And Pam is posting that on all her social media networks. Okay, that is it for today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again to Liz Brunig. Thank you for supporting the podcast. And I hope to see you tonight at the Happy Hour Hang. It's a new day in America and on planet Earth, ladies and gentlemen. And that's a good thing. Stay connected. Stay close. Keep talking. We still have a horrific pandemic raging. Get vaccinated. And I will talk to you right here tomorrow on Stand Up. See you tonight, 8 p.m. Subscribe if you haven't already. And take it away, John Carroll. Stand up. When the tyrants taunt you in the sirens teach you better stand up. Stand up. Let the brave meet the challenge. Let the meek weak flee. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. When you're tired of begging, saying pretty please, that's the time you got to Get up on your knees When you can't see the forest full the burning trees You got to stand up Hey, you've been sitting so long You got the creaky knees You got to stand up Stand up I think you're driving wheels In leaking grease Boy, you better stand up Stand up Well, there's a whole lot more of us Who know us right They'll keep right on ignoring us For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, or you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Stand our ground and then stay.
change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eyes. We gotta let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. Seat of that experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe. Rise up, show up. To the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you Not to run and hide It says stand up Stand oh, up Oh, got to stand up Oh, come on Just stand up Everybody got to stand up In the darkest hour Stand up People got the power Stand up Come on, come on, come on Come on, come on, come on to get there. Well, it's I, cruel what they're doing to those coal miners and those steel miners by acting like they're gonna, their jobs are going to come back. They should be retrained in renewable energies and any other number of industries in the future. But, but I don't, but I also, with all due respect to your point, I don't, I think that that's traditionally true about people voting, you know, with their wallets or their pocketbooks or whatever they keep their money in these days. They're, but but the idea, the, I, I think people also have a certain amount of integrity, and and we're embarrassed. We are embarrassed that every right. day we I, wake up and he's our president, do, and that yes. is enough to vote against that motherfucker. It is. Sorry. That's me on real time in March 2018 for you. Show enders, everybody. Hashtag show enders. We did it. He's gone. We voted that motherfucker out. Peace be with you.